on this Wednesday night, the facts about Canada's supply chain problem. A convoy of truckers heading to Ottawa claims the vaccine mandate is to blame. But where's the evidence? The idea to reduce the supply chain's issues to a vaccine mandate is, is inaccurate and is false. We look at what's led to some empty shelves at grocery stores. How Canada is supporting Ukraine. Everything we do is motivated by our pursuit of de-escalation. And no concessions, NATO and Russia hold firm to their positions. We're ready either way. And we look at the messaging from the Kremlin to the Russian public. Cleared for takeoff, the air car gets the green light in Slovakia. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a look at what's causing empty shelves and low stock in some grocery stores. Industry experts agree the country is not running out of food. There is no crisis, but there is a lot of blame going around about the root cause of problems with the supply chain. Among the loudest voices is the self-described Freedom Convoy that's heading to Ottawa. Its supporters blame the government, call public health restrictions unlawful and claim the vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers has reduced the supply of goods. They have a whole host of other grievances too, some even calling for the government to be overthrown. Well, a couple of important points. The majority of Canadian truckers are vaccinated and the U.S. has the same vaccine mandate for cross-border truckers. It's not just Canada. Tonight, David Aiken has a reality check on what's causing the supply chain problem. Many in the convoy say they've had enough with vaccine mandates. A lot of people are trying to say that these types of things are, are done out of anger, but this is actually being done out of frustration towards the things that the, the government is imposing upon Canadian citizens. And federal conservatives are lining up squarely behind this protest, blaming the Trudeau government's vaccine mandate for truckers for grocery store shelves that may not look like they normally do. On Wednesday, Trudeau's transport minister rejected those claims. It's, it's misguided at best. It is irresponsible at worst to be promoting fear and panic among Canadians that our food supply is at risk. The CEO of one of the country's major grocery store chains, Metro, confirmed that view in an investor call Tuesday, though the CEO said the vaccine mandate may push some prices up. On the vaccination of truckers, um, it's, it's having or, or will have mostly an inflationary impact on the cost of uh, merchandise coming in from the U.S., produce especially. Uh, we, we saw an uptick in, in, in the transportation costs uh, right away, but we're getting the merchandise. Um, so our, our transportation providers are able to service us. In fact, the biggest problem causing product shortages right now is Omicron, forcing employees to stay off the job, be it on the farm, in the warehouse, or in grocery stores. The pandemic slowed things down across the supply chain, but Omicron was a huge blow to the food industry. Um, you have to really operate and do the same things with way fewer people around. So the idea um, to reduce the supply chain's issues to a vaccine mandate is, is inaccurate and is false. And then there's the problems the convoy itself may cause disrupting national highways. Canadians support truckers, but I, I, don't, I don't believe they, they, they support the convoy because the convoy is creating some disruptions. And, and that's the last thing we need right now. Meanwhile, police responsible for Parliament Hill are preparing for the arrival this weekend of possibly hundreds of big rigs, many they expect will be filled with angry truckers. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Now to the tension over Ukraine. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has authorized the deployment of more Canadian troops to Ukraine as it resists what he calls unwarranted Russian aggression. 60 more troops will be sent now to join 200 already on Operation Unifier in Ukraine. The number could increase to 400 in the months ahead. And unlike some of our allies, Canada will be sending non-lethal equipment only. Today, I've authorized the extension of Operation Unifier for three more years and the expansion of this training mission as well as immediate support. This also includes a provision of non-lethal equipment, intelligence sharing and support to combat cyber attacks.
The Prime Minister says Canada is supplying non-lethal equipment only because the solution to the standoff is diplomatic. The Ukrainian government, though, has asked for weapons. In an exclusive interview, the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council told Global News the threat from Russia's president is worldwide. He points to the poisoning of enemies of Vladimir Putin and cyber attacks on sovereign nations. Our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gamansing spoke with him. Crystal. Ukraine is expressing its gratitude to Canada for its economic and ongoing military training support. But the country's national security chief also says right now his country's needs are clear. It's uh, defense uh, weapons. Defense weapons. And once more, uh, defense weapons. The United States and the UK have sent military supplies, including weapons, to Ukraine. As anxieties remain over whether the nation of 44 million will be plunged into another war with Russia, Oleksiy Danilov says only the Kremlin knows for sure. He cautions world leaders from using the number of Russian troops on the border as a gauge. Military science is much more complicated than just uh, amounts of people, those uh, people in uniform who are standing on the wall. Is he worried about cyber attacks? Is he worried about terrorist attacks yeah. that could take out key infrastructure? Yes, those are cyber attacks, uh, energy attacks and uh, information attacks and then in numerous directions in which aggression can be carried out. In Kyiv, talk of war turns to prayer and appeals for calm. Nothing has changed. I took 10 onions, as I usually do. No need to panic. Whatever is said or not said, whatever is done or not done. While Ukraine calls for defense supports, Russia released another dramatic military operations video and a ruling party official said Russia should next arm ethnic Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. The families of Canadian diplomats here in Ukraine have been told to go home along with those at the American and UK embassies. Oleksiy Danilov says he understands those people have a home to go back to. For Ukrainians, this is home. And so if called upon, they will fight for their country. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamansing in Ukraine tonight. Thanks. Efforts to use diplomacy instead of conflict to resolve the tension there are continuing tonight. The U.S. and its allies have delivered written responses to Russian demands for security guarantees over NATO expansion, but say there will be no concessions. Russia wants assurances that Ukraine and Georgia will never be allowed to join NATO, and it said refusal to do so will amount to an aggression. Jackson Prosko has the latest on where things stand. It was the U.S. ambassador in Moscow who hand-delivered the response to Russia's demands, outlining the American position on a path forward as Russia continued its massive military buildup near Ukraine. We've laid out a diplomatic path. We've lined up steep consequences should Russia choose further aggression. It remains up to Russia to decide how to respond. We're ready either way. What exactly the U.S. offered isn't known, but there were no major concessions. Moscow has vowed what it calls necessary retaliatory measures if its demands aren't met. That includes clawing back the size of NATO and stopping countries like Ukraine from joining the alliance. In this fragile moment, Ukrainian officials warn Russia may be plotting something other than a full-fledged invasion. What we currently see is a scenario of destabilization of Ukraine. And that scenario is certainly imminent. Overnight, more American weaponry was shuttled into Kyiv. The U.S. and its allies are now considering an immediate deployment of troops to NATO's eastern flank, instead of waiting for Russia to act first. Tensions are increasing. Uh, Russia continues its military buildup. We call on Russia once again to immediately de-escalate the situation. Instead, Russian President Vladimir Putin continues to drop hints about the levers he could pull in a conflict. In a meeting with Italian business leaders, he stressed the importance of Russian gas supplies to Europe, a tap he could easily turn off during any conflict.
The U.S. insists it did make serious offers for a diplomatic de-escalation, but the Russians have signaled little appetite for what they consider endless discussions. Asked how he thought Putin would respond to the American proposal, the U.S. Secretary of State replied, we'll see. Donna? Jackson in Washington, thanks. The view from inside Russia is much different than in the West. Russia's highly developed propaganda machine is working overtime, and Russian state TV and social media are presenting a different picture to the Russian people. As Jeff Semple explains, the narrative may reveal clues about Moscow's broader strategy. Russian state TV can provide a window into the Kremlin. The networks are tasked with telling Vladimir Putin's preferred version of events. But what's perhaps most remarkable about their coverage these days is what they're not talking about. I don't perceive a lot of uh, war preparations, not in the rhetoric on state TV. This Canadian-Ukrainian journalist has lived in Russia for 35 years. He remembers the warmongering prior to Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008 and annexation of Crimea in 2014. Back then, Russian TV screens were dominated by images of violent Ukrainians overthrowing their pro-Russian government. But Fred Weir says this time is different. The tone in state TV is the hope for peace. I, I just don't see the, the warmongering that is imputed to, to Russia. There's virtually nothing about uh, the military maneuvers and buildups. Much of the coverage has focused instead on diplomacy, on Putin, the great statesman, forcing the Americans to the table. In that situation, the Russian regime can present itself as a strong international power, as a power that wants peace but is ready to defend itself. Rasmus Nilsson says that's likely due to Russia's national mood. Opinion polls show ordinary Russians do not want war with Ukraine. This independent Russian pollster says that Russians are completely opposed to war. They want a diplomatic solution. But they also believe that the West will stop at nothing to push Kyiv to attack Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. That belief is fueled in part by headlines like these, claiming without evidence that Kyiv and NATO plan to attack Russian-speaking communities in eastern Ukraine. Analysts warn this propaganda is designed to convince Russians that the Kremlin has no choice but to intervene in Ukraine. Well, the classic, classic false flag, uh, that we're moving now because they are preparing an attack. And to save our fellow Russians from Ukrainian aggression, we have no other alternative uh, but, to, but, but to do this. A potential Russian military invasion of eastern Ukraine being sold as a humanitarian rescue mission to defend a Russian-speaking population against attacks from the West. Jeff Semple, Global News. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is still in power, but the pressure to resign because of parties held during lockdown is getting even more intense. We've taken the tough decisions, we've got the big calls right, and we're, and in particular I, am getting on with the job. He's waiting for results not just of an internal investigation, but a police investigation, too. It was thought the internal report by a top civil servant into boozy parties at Downing Street during lockdown might be released today. It hasn't been, leaving Johnson to sweat. Several of his Conservative MPs have said they're waiting for the findings before deciding if they'll join calls for him to step down. A New Brunswick doctor takes on Facebook. Coming up, the implications of a lawsuit against the social media giant. Tonight, we're taking a closer look at a lawsuit that could have implications for social media platforms. It centers on a New Brunswick doctor who says he was wrongly accused of causing a COVID-19 outbreak that resulted in the death of two people. He's suing the New Brunswick government, the RCMP, and Facebook for allegedly allowing hateful messages to circulate. Ross Lord reports on the implications of that lawsuit. Dr. Jean-Robert Angola says he feels betrayed, not only by New Brunswickers who blamed him for violating COVID-19 rules and spreading the virus, but also by Facebook for allowing racist, threatening messages to circulate online. Facebook must block that. That's sampled. Facebook must, must block that. 
Angola alleges the hateful messages were shared thousands of times around the world, causing him to fear for his life. His lawsuit pursues punitive damages of 3% of Facebook meta net profits, with the company's net annual income estimated at more than $86 billion. The claim could be worth a fortune. His lawyers say it's time for the company to recognize the destruction and devastation that their actions caused. Going after Facebook in court is a recent development. The tendency of people to see them now as a viable defendant is new. This constitutional law specialist says it's partly because of whistleblower Francis Haugen, who suggested Facebook meta is fixated on profit at the expense of safety. American-based court challenges have been thwarted by free speech protections, but in Canada, there are stronger limits on things like the racist attacks and alleged threats hurled at Angola. That's the very first section of our Constitution, that all the rights in the Charter are subject to reasonable limits, including the free speech rights, which almost certainly will be a key defense that Facebook will put forward in this case. Others say Angola's case could establish how much responsibility social media platforms should take in helping protect and not damage people's well-being. I do think we need more regulation for social media companies. They hold extraordinary uh, power in our communities. They're the main way that we engage in uh, public dialogue. In a statement, Facebook Meta says it doesn't comment on pending litigation. Ross Lord, Global News. The Bank of Canada is holding its benchmark interest rate steady, but warns it will rise. Despite surging inflation, the central bank is keeping its key lending rate at 0.25 percent. That's the same level it's been since the onset of the pandemic. The bank's governor says uncertainty about Omicron is one of the key reasons to hold it steady, but don't expect that to last. As the pandemic fades, conditions will normalize and inflation will come down. However, with Canadian labour markets tightening and evidence of capacity pressures increasing, Governing Council expects higher interest rates will be needed to bring inflation back to the 2% target. The U.S. Federal Reserve also held its key interest rate steady today and signaled a hike could come as early as March. Ahead, a major rescue off Spain's Canary Islands saves hundreds. More than 300 migrants rescued from the ocean have arrived in Spain. They were saved after seven boats got into trouble off the Canary Islands. Officials say some people were found clinging to a capsized boat. Most of the people are believed to be from northern and central Africa. There are reports at least 18 others did not survive the ordeal, but no bodies have been recovered. And a search is underway off the coast of Florida, where a boat suspected in human smuggling capsized in a storm. The U.S. Coast Guard is scouring the water for 38 people. At least one body has been found, and another person was rescued after he was spotted clinging to an overturned boat. He says the group left the Bahamian island of Bimini, about 80 kilometers east of Miami, on Saturday night. No one was wearing a life jacket. The U.S. has launched a criminal investigation. In Syria, U.S.-backed Kurdish-led forces have regained full control of a prison a week after it was seized by so-called Islamic State militants. Syrian Democratic Forces took back control of the last section of the prison today, freeing a number of child detainees who were used as human shields. The brazen assault is the group's most high-profile ISIS attack since the loss of their so-called caliphate in 2019. Dozens of fighters on both sides were killed and thousands of people living nearby have been displaced. Wheels up next, where this flying car is taking flight. It's been a science fiction staple for decades, a vehicle that can seamlessly take you from the road to the sky. All kinds of companies are now working on flying cars. It's a highly competitive race. And in Slovakia, regulators have actually given one car the green light. Mike Drolet reports. When people talk about flying cars, the Jetsons come to mind, or Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I, know I prefer James Bond, the man with the golden gun. No he had something better. 
car that sprouted wings. Client Vision's air car has that same vibe. From soaring in the skies high above Europe to landing in an airstrip, it's clearly a plane. But in three minutes, all those flying parts get tucked away, leaving a sports car. It's not one thing or the other. Is it a flying car or a rotable aircraft? It's a flying car. Well, actually, it's a flying car that's now been certified as airworthy in the heart of Europe by the Slovakian State Transport Agency. It's a bit confusing, but it basically allows someone to land the car in any European jurisdiction that gives it the green light, and which also has a landing strip. This might be good to go from your larger multi-hectare estate to another multi-hectare estate or a small airport. But really, uh, that's sort of some of the limitations between uh, some of these uh, some of these new kinds of, uh, you know, quote unquote, flying vehicles. Now, the flying car market is surprisingly saturated. Everybody seems to have their own idea of what it will look like. Some think the future will look more like the Lilium jet or the Volocopter, both of which are more air taxi than flying car. The Canadian-made Blackfly is neither. It's a personal aerial vehicle, which is just really cool. But that's not the market Anton Zajac is interested in. He's all about finding a way around that morning commute. Uh, traffic is driving me crazy. Uh, when I go skiing, I, I, I can't ski when I have to wait in line. So I, I just quit, quit skiing. I, I just hate lines. Maybe because I used to live in a communist country and you would have to wait for everything. You know? Yeah, we know. Traffic sucks. So why not just take off? Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. That is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this view from Grouse Mountain in North Vancouver. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Please email us, yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.